Well, good morning to your brothers and sisters. Grace and peace to you all. If you're joining us for the first time and you weren't with us last night, welcome to the Cantero Institute's annual Niagara Conference. If you're not familiar with the Cantero Institute, it's a relatively new ministry. And uh, this is our first time uh, having our uh, an annual, well, our first annual conference was last year at Brock University. Today it is at Heritage Congregation. Uh, but it is the first time in which uh, we are here in Jordan Station. Uh, last evening we had the privilege of having Reverend Casey Horvath with us to open our conference. And he spoke on learning confession and repentance with the Psalms and Reformers. And such a pastoral and personal lecture served as a most fitting introduction to our conference post Tenebras Lux, Light After Darkness. It's been our vision as an institute on this occasion to look back upon our Protestant history, to learn of God's past doings, and what we can learn for our living Coram Deo today before the face of God. Now, every session of our conference has a distinct focus, and I have the privilege to address you this morning on perhaps a most neglected and misunderstood aspect of our Protestant history, uh, the Spanish Reformation. Now, admittedly, to suggest that the Spanish Reformation has been a neglected and misunderstood aspect does appear to be, perhaps at its surface, an unqualified and blanket statement. Because you can, after all, find a select number of publications on the history of Spanish Protestantism, but when you compare just how much has been written on the subject, whether as journal articles, perhaps dissertations, or select publications, and you compare that to how much has been written on Protestantism, for example, in Germany, or in the Netherlands, or perhaps even England, it becomes apparent that on the one side, you perhaps have a small puddle that you can jump into, whereas on the other side, you have the water reservoir of the Hoover Dam. What accounts for this particular differential lies in part in the conventional narrative surrounding the history and the religious character of Spain. A 16th century Spain, after all, was known for its Catholic religious fervor. It was known for its inquisitorial office and the autos de fe. The autos de fe were these public executions of Protestants, uh, these massive burnings done in such a public style. One could reasonably ask, can anything good and Protestant come from Catholic Spain? But such a narrative is not one solely constructed by those outside looking in. It's also proudly upheld by the Spanish people. In the 1923 publication of the Encyclopedia Universal Ilustrada, which translated into English is the Universal Illustrated Encyclopedia of Spain, the Reformation in Spain is dismissed as something non-existent. It states that its influence was perhaps minimal at best due to the prior Catholic reforms of Francisco Jiménez de Cisneros, who was a Spanish cardinal and the Grand Inquisitor. It also states that such a reformation was doomed from the very start due to the deeply rooted and irrefutable Romanism of the time. And lastly, it states that any whiff of the reformation was stamped out by the Spanish Inquisition. And while the extinguishment of such Spanish Protestantism is certainly vastly over-exaggerated, there's no denying that the Inquisition was like an octopus with widespread tentacles, extending as far as to the New World and the Americas, and as well as the Philippines. The very idea that the Reformation never occurred in Spain is at face value erroneous. It's wrong. There was, in fact, a movement most notably in two cities which were considered early Protestant centers, those being the city of Sevilla and Valladolid. According to the late English scholar Arthur Gordon Kindle, this Reformation movement began in the 1540s and continued through the 1550s, but was completely stamped out by the Inquisition in the early 1560s. This movement had its origins both in native currents of evangelical thought and anti-Roman feelings, and also in ideas imported from Erasmus and mainstream reformers through literary and political contacts with more northerly countries. 
To be historically and contextually precise, the Spanish Reformation did come to an end in the early 1560s if we're referring specifically to the movement within Spanish borders. However, if we're, if we're referring to the Reformation of God's Spanish-speaking church, which had been exiled from her motherland, that Reformation has in fact never come to an end. Instead, in keeping with that reformational phrase, semper reformanda, the church has continually sought to be reformed according to the teachings of God's Word. Now, it may not be obvious in the perhaps broader Spanish-speaking church today, particularly with the ample dispersion of Arminianism amongst as well uh, the incursion of several false doctrines, and the prosperity gospel making several inroads, but there's always been a faithful remnant of Reformed Spanish Protestants who have sought this ongoing Reformation. And it's been quite recently that we've been seeing a resurgence, we've been seeing a flourishment of the doctrines of grace more faithfully preached and applied. We're seeing this in Colombia. We're seeing this in the Dominican Republic, in Mexico. We're seeing this as well in Brazil, which though they're not Spanish speakers, they're Portuguese speakers, but they were very significantly influenced by the Spanish crown. Now, if what I've said so far suffices for an introduction to our subject matter, and you have to bear in mind that this subject matter of the Spanish Reformation would require more than just a Saturday morning lecture, I want us to walk through some select biographic profiles of these Spanish reformers. And in this way, what we'll have are several glimpses into what was the Spanish Reformation. Glimpses of a greater panorama. Pieces of a greater mosaic, snippets of a larger, more complex narrative. The first to be graced with such an honor is a relatively humble printer's apprentice who is not known for his writing, but rather for the great risks that he undertook to smuggle in Protestant works into Spain. His name is Julian Hernandez familiarly known by his contemporaries as Julianillo, uh, which on the one hand was a tier, term of uh, endearment, and on the other hand was also in reference to his thin frame, one writing that he was nothing more than simply skin and bone. Now, we're not told how he became a Protestant, but we can only imagine that his work as a printer's apprentice while outside of Spain acquainted him with several Lutheran works. And at some point prior to 1550, he not only embraced the true and biblical faith, but also a profound conviction to smuggle copies of the Spanish scriptures and other Reformed literature into Spain. As the Banner of Truth's J. McPherson writes, the Jesuit writer Santibanez complains that Julianillo, with incredible skill, discovered secret entrances and exits, and the poison of the new heresy spread rapidly throughout all Castile and Andalusia of Spain. He himself taught men and women in the evil doctrines of the reformers, attaining his aim all too successfully. Julianillo's main deposit for the books he smuggled, hidden in wine casks, was the San Isidro Monastery. And from there, he traveled in a variety of disguises to place the books in eager hands stretched out to receive them." End quote. This particularly dangerous work of smuggling scriptures and reformed literature into a nation that for the most part prohibited the scriptures in the common tongue of the people, and which loathed all things reformed, took place between the years 1550 and 1559. Amongst the works that Julianillo brought in were the New Testament translations of Juan Perez de Pineda. When one considers the laborious groundwork that Julianillo engaged in, it would be no exaggeration to say that without Julianillo's efforts, the Protestant centers of Valladolid and Sevilla would have suffered as a result. Given the religio-cultural context, the recovery of the biblical gospel, of God's truth, could only have been possible with the word of God in the common tongue. And Julianesia was the instrument that God providentially used to bring the scriptures to the commoner's hands. Eventually, Julianesia was caught. Most likely, he was betrayed by someone who had feigned interest in his smuggled contents. And standing before the Tribunal del Santo Oficio de la Inquisición, which was located in Sevilla, 
He was condemned and tortured in the most barbarous methods. McPherson, in his research, writes that at the hands of the Inquisition, Julianisha was tortured for approximately three whole years. In the end, after having dislocated several of his limbs, Julianisha was brought out to be burned at the stake for all to see. While we don't have a date for his birth, we do have a date for his martyrdom. December 22nd, the year 1560. Having endured what this humble man had endured, we would not have imagined perhaps his final words. He did not meet death with a whimper. He did not face it with regret. Even in the midst of the most excruciating pain, as a disfigured person, he sang aloud so that all the public could hear. And what was it that he sung? What was it that carol that he sung that so angered his persecutors? It was this. Vencidos van los frailes, vencidos van, corridos van los lobos, corridos van, which meant, translated to English, the friars go vanquished, they go vanquished, the wolves go running, running, they go. Why do you think Julianillo had been tortured for three whole years? He had been tortured in hopes that he would recant, that he would plead clemency, and that he would find comfort in the penitence that the Catholic Church had offered him. The fact that he had been brought to the stake for all Sevilla to see was a clear testament of his unbreakable faith and conviction. This humble printer's apprentice, smuggler of scriptures and reformed literature, endured the inquisitorial agents and the friars who supposedly knew the scriptures all the better than he. His death he perceived, was nothing more than his persecutors admitting defeat. They could not undo God's work of salvation in his heart. Why did I begin with Julianijo? Because those whom I'm about to mention next owe a great debt to the work of Julianijo. It was because of Julianijo that they had several Protestant works in their hands, including provisional Spanish translations of the New Testament. And with such literary works, they were able to do the Lord's work with greater fidelity and precision. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul's writings to the church in Rome in Romans 10, 14 to 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Well, what beautiful feet were those of Julianijo? If you remember, I'd cited how one of the principal locations where Julianijo delivered his barrels full of scriptures, they were all packed in wine casks, uh, was the monastery of San Isidro. It was very much a Protestant missionary center, though not overtly. Uh, this monastery was located just a few miles northwest of Sevilla, and it was home to a religious order called the Observantine Hieronymites. Now, I'll refrain from speaking too much about that particular order and its influence because there's still a lot of research to do, ongoing study that's being carried out on that. But according to the scholar Louis J. Hutton, it was a religious order that, with the influence of the Reformed faith, held the potential to deeply influence the culture and the development of Spain. And the reason for this lies in that, contrary to the medieval scholastic tendency to regard all things spiritual as superior to the earthly, this particular order held in very high regard the common work of men and how this might be perceived as integral to man's worship of God. Hodden referred to it as a distinctive Spanish spirituality, something unlike seen in the rest of the country. A preliminary, but certainly very raw form of what we today would call the Protestant work ethic, something which would later emerge from the Protestant Reformation thanks to reformers like Martin Luther and John Calvin, to name just two prominent figures. Well, as the Reformation spread throughout Europe, Reformed ideas reached the monastery in the 1550s, and it didn't take long until there was a significant number who had embraced the Reformed faith. There were about 
roughly 20 monks there who had embraced the Reformed faith. Of course, given the very nature of the religious order and where they were located, they were not what you would call outward Protestants. They knew better. They knew well the perils of the Spanish Inquisition and that the Inquisition had not yet turned its full gaze towards what was happening within Spain, at least in relation to what they was referred to as the Lutheran heresy. Now, for the sake of context, it was around this time that the Inquisition was faced with an identity crisis. Since the Inquisition had been instituted, the Inquisition had sought the religious purity of Spain by converting, expelling, and executing Jews and Muslims. But by this time, neither Judaism nor Islam were perceived as internal threats. They had dealt with that sufficiently. So you could say that it was a predatorial institution without any substantive prey, chasing after minor sects such as those of the Alumbrados, who were a hodgepodge of Catholic, Lutheran, and mystical Gnostic influences. They were looking for a reason for their existence. And when it became clear that Protestantism was alive and well in Spain, and threatening to actually alter the religio-cultural status quo, the Inquisition found its solution to its identity crisis. And clinging to their newfound purpose, no part of the global Spanish empire would be deemed too far to extend its reach and to administer its misperceived justice. Before this inland Protestant discovery, however, those who embraced the Reformed faith in the monastery held a deep desire, a deep desire to disseminate scriptural truth all across Spain, and not just Spain, but in the New World as well. At about this time, Spain was active in establishing settlements and colonies in the Americas. They had already engaged with the indigenous population, and many Catholic church leaders and missionaries were operating missions in their midst, attempting to Christianize the natives in accordance with the norms and standards of Rome. Evidence of this desire to disseminate Reformed literature to the New World is a translated Spanish Bible dated to the 16th century, which is presently housed in the Biblioteca Nacional de Colombia, the National Library of Colombia in Bogota. It's a surviving artifact after mass burnings had taken place throughout the Americas. And one of the ways in which it escaped detection was as opposed to the usual cover images that were used for Spanish Bible translation, they used a Pegasus, which was an image that had never been used before. And it was in Latin, and the first couple of pages were also in Latin. So when they first began to look through, uh, they did have inquisitorial agents there checking whatever would come into the New World. And when they would check the books, they would see it was in Latin, they would think this is nothing of concern, and they would put it aside and it would go on. Unfortunately, not many Bibles survived. As scholar Cornelius Hegman highlights in one case, it was informed that the bishop Agustin Davila Padilla arrived from Mexico to Santo Domingo, uh, took 300 copies of the Protestant Bible in the year 1599, and ordered them burnt in public because the Council of Trent forbade the laity from reading the Bible. Other works were found in the New World, such as those of Constantino Ponce de la Fuente, which had been imported and distributed throughout Spanish and Portuguese colonies. And one such example is that of the Franciscan bishop Juan de Zumaraga, the first bishop of Mexico, who applied Ponce's teaching to the Mesoamerican mission field. In fact, there's evidence that the Nahua, the Zacatecas of Mexico, were instructed in the biblical basics of the Christian faith through Ponce's own writings. Now, on the matter of the converted brothers at the monastery of San Isidro, I'll return to that later, because there are two in particular that I wish to make mention of. But considering that I just mentioned Constantino Ponce de la Fuente, it's a long name, I know. It would be fitting that I first address who he was in the context of everything, because he was a significant influencer and supporter of what went on at the monastery. Now, similar to the case of Julianillo, we don't have an exact date for when Ponce was born. What we do know is that he was born in San Clemente de la Mancha, in the province of Cuenca in Spain, and sometime around the year 1502. He appears to have hailed from a Jewish background, 
However, given his prominence amongst the Catholic clergy, he must have been a distant descendant of a Jewish convert. William Jones, in his dissertation, a biography of Ponce, writes that none of Ponce's own books reveal anything of his own ancestry, and the reason for this lies in the anti-Semitic nature of 16th century Spanish culture. Ponce had clearly learned how to conceal certain aspects of himself, something which he would employ when he became a Protestant. But before I can address that, I should explain first how he came about his prominence amongst the Catholic clergy and especially amongst the common people of Sevilla. Ponce had received a theological education at the Universidad de Acala, and upon the completion of his studies, arrived in Sevilla in 1533 to carry out his work as a Catholic minister. He was one of two chief preachers at the Sevillan Cathedral, and it said that many flocked to Mass when they learned that it was Ponce who would be preaching. His gift for the exposition of the biblical text can only be grasped through the few writings that have survived to this day. Many were burned and destroyed when he was discovered to be a Protestant. But his most notable exposition of the first Psalm of David is a title that's worth acquiring and reviewing. As a matter of fact, I have a copy here, and you'll find it at the book table uh, right by the entrance. And to quote our dear brother, Dr. Tevin Ralty, who's here with us today, Ponce delivers God's Word with a beauty and goodness that makes its truth not just persuasive, but delightful and wondrous. His whole explanation of Psalm 1, and particularly his contrast of the hearts of the righteous and the wicked, is deeply reformed. How did a preacher at the Sevillan Cathedral become prominent amongst the people when he, what he taught was reformed? Well, the answer is found in that Ponce never publicly declared himself to be reformed. He knew well then to reveal his cards too soon when the Reformation had not yet made sufficient headway in Spain. He occupied an office, a position, with the privilege of leading the masses down the path of biblical truth. Why forfeit this opportunity by mentioning Luther or Calvin when the scriptural text could speak for itself and therefore save him any needless obstruction? You see, it was around the time that he began his ministerial work in Sevilla that a Spanish, Spanish Protestant Reformation movement was just starting to begin. Given his place at the Sevillan Cathedral, Ponce had close fellowship with those of the monastery of San Isidro. And given the later records of the Inquisition, it was not far-fetched to assume that many of Ponce's sermons and writings, along with his book collection, were largely due to what had been smuggled into the monastery by Julianillo. But suspicion was not enough to arrest and put to trial such a prominent, well-loved Catholic preacher. Not at first. Something more substantive had to have happened, and something did. But prior to that something, from the years 1548 to 1553, Ponce was given the honor of serving as the king's chaplain. And having earned high respect for his moving sermons, his return to Sevilla may have been with a greater boldness to teach and proclaim the truth recovered by the Reformer. Of course, by this time, given the heightened sensitivity by the Inquisition and Ponce's five-year absence from the city, the conditions were ripe for Ponce to be interrogated under suspicion alone. And he was under investigation until they could attain some substantive evidence of his Protestant influence. Throughout this time, Ponce confessed his Catholicity. When he was confronted with a collection of writings from his hand, many of which were explicitly Lutheran, that is to say Protestant, and which had been discovered after being hidden away in a sympathizer's home, he had a secret library, it was hidden behind a secret wall, as a wall that had been set up, no one had known about it until uh, it had broken down and the inquisitorial agents discovered it, and they saw it had his name, they brought it before him. And at that point, Ponce admitted that what he had written was, in fact, his profession of faith. He was a covert Protestant, and he would now declare it, saying, yes, this is what I believe, and I will not recant. You see, Ponce was a covert Protestant who addressed the Catholic minister. And when he took the pulpit at the cathedral, he preached unashamedly as a reformer without declaring himself to be a reformer. And given the favor that he had earned from the Spanish king and how loved he was by the people, Ponce was offered time and again a chance to recant. 
Ponce refused. It said that when King Charles V, whom Ponce had served as chaplain, discovered Ponce's sentencing as a Protestant heretic, he exclaimed in disappointment, you could not have condemned a greater man. If Constantino is a heretic, he is a great one. There was, of course, no change in the course for the Spanish king, who was also considered the Holy Roman Emperor in terms of his civil authority. Ponce, like many others, died a martyr's death. But in Ponce's case, he didn't make it as far as to a public execution. While awaiting the date of execution, it said that he suffered dysentery while imprisoned at the castle of Triana. And there he died of natural causes. And those who despised him began to invent stories of his death. He was a well-loved figure. To have him as a public martyr would certainly not bode well for Catholic Spain. And so they began to invent all these different stories, claiming that he had, been, that he had committed suicide and therefore damned his soul to hell. But as a 20th century scholar, Piedro Rodriguez writes, these Romanist accounts, far from being consistent, decisively contradict each other. There are various different stories. The truth is, Ponce died unashamedly for the faith he had in the biblical gospel and in stark opposition to the corruption and false teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. The Lord afforded him a mercy to go and be with him in paradise. Of course, just so you know how sinister the Inquisition was, after he had already been uh, entombed, they dug up his bones, in, uh, one of the great autos de fe, and burned his bones as a sort of symbolism of the condemnation of Ponce. There are two more figures I wish to call our attention to. Cassiodoro de Reina and Cipriano de Valera, both of whom were monks at the monastery at San Isidro del Campo, and both of whom would have known Ponce. I'll begin first with Reina because it's believed that he served as a mentor for a time for Valera. Reina is believed to have been born in the year 1520 in Montemolin, in the province of, of Badajoz in Spain. And his early interest in the Christian scriptures led him to becoming a monk of the Hieronymite monastery in about the year 1557. It's believed that during his service as a monk, he would not have known Ponce, um, not only have known Ponce, but also have benefited from his teachings and his mentorship. His time at the monastery, however, was short-lived. At some point, we know that he became a Protestant after having read the Protestant works that had been smuggled in. And instead of simply being an observant and quiet Protestant convert, Reina became a central figure in the growth and organization of the Protestants in the city of Sevilla. Some say that he may have occupied an informal pastoral role over those who had come to faith. Well, whatever that might have looked like, it didn't last long because the Inquisition had caught whiff of what had been transpiring at the monastery of San Isidro. Now, not all the monks were Protestants, as I had mentioned, but a significant number were, about 20 of them. And having been tipped off that the Inquisition was soon to fall upon the monastery, several Protestant converts fled from Spain. Rain and Valera were amongst those who fled. Where would they go? Well, each Spanish reformer has their own story, and I'm, there are a couple of names I'm leaving out for, for the sake of time. In Reina's case, he traveled to Geneva with Valera in 1558. But with news that a friend of his had been killed, that being the Unitarian heretic Servetus, Reina feared that Geneva was becoming a new Rome. He was allowing his feelings to paint a different picture of what Geneva was meant to be. And this led to Reina migrating from Geneva to London, England. And by this time, which was the year 1559, England had opened its borders to Protestant refugees. Prior to this, there was a terrible persecution of Protestants under Queen Mary I, which had lasted from the year 1553 to 1558. But now, under Elizabethan rule, England was becoming a refuge for Protestant foreigners. This was where Reina would first settle, and this was where Reina would plant a church for Spanish-speaking Protestants. There were several Spanish-speaking refugees who were attending various different churches, different consistories. There was the Fleming, the Italian, uh, the French consistories there in London, uh, but none of them had a church to call their own in their own language. Well, this was also where he would write 
and publish with Valera's editorial assistance the Spanish Confession of the Christian Faith. And we have a copy of that bilingual edition, English and Spanish, at, near the entrance. And furthermore, in London was where Reina would begin to dedicate more time towards realizing his dream. And what was his dream? The complete Spanish translation of the Old and New Testaments. To keep the story short, because it's a long story, after a few years, Reina would be forced to flee England, finding a home in Frankfurt. And this is the reason why. The Inquisition had been keeping tabs of his progress ever since escaping Spain. They were keeping tabs of his progress of the church he planted, of the Spanish confession he had written uh, for the consistory of churches in London, which no doubt he would have sent a copy to the king of Spain. And they were particularly wary of his work on translating the entire Bible into Spanish. There were several attempts to do so, but Reina was intent on completing it. So in an effort to dislodge him from the safe harbors of England, the, Inquis the Inquisition bribed a fellow Spanish exile to construct a scandal, a most horrendous scandal, and falsely accuse Reina. It would ruin and tarnish his reputation amongst the churches. And it worked, in the sense that Reina was frightened and fled for his life. It would become clear after several legal proceedings that the accuser had simply been offered safe return to Spain if he could simply sabotage Reina's character and ministry with a false accusation. The accusations were proven to be false, but it had done its damage. It was 1564 when Reina arrived in Frankfurt, and by God's grace, he evaded the Inquisition while en route through Antwerp because they were waiting for him as he left England. They had their agents searching for him throughout Europe, and Reina managed to escape through their fingers. Well, having settled uh, there with his family, Reina dedicated most of his time towards completing his Spanish translation of the Bible. And when it was completed, it was published in the year 1569 as La Biblia del Oso. I don't have it on the table, but I do have a, a facsimile reproduction of that first Spanish Bible translation that you can ask upon request at the table, the registration table, and you can take a look at so what it would look like, what it was like. And it was, uh, the La Biblia del Oso means the Bible of the bear. And the reason it had that name was because there was a bear on its front cover imagery. And some say that there's theological significance to it. Uh, it's most likely having to do also with the name of the printer. Uh, the printer's name had something to do with a bear, and so it just happened to be that that image was used. But looking back, uh, Reina's translation was no small feat. He had used a number of ancient texts that were available at his disposal to realize his translation, including the Ferrara Bible, which is the Hebrew Bible in Ladino, the Masoretic text, the Vetus Latina, the Receptus, Receptus of Erasmus, and even various Syriac manuscripts. And he was not without assistance because he used Perez de Pineda's earlier New Testament translation to aid him in the full text edition of what he was working on. It's thanks to Reina's work um, that Spanish speakers all around the world today have the Reina Valera Bible translation. Now, having mentioned the Reina Valera Bible translation, and it's a very common translation, you ask any Spanish Protestant, any Spanish uh, believer, uh, whether Presbyterian uh, or Baptist uh, or even Pentecostal for that matter, and you ask them what Bible translation they're using, what Bible version, they will always mention the Reina Valera. There are new versions coming out now, but the Reina Valera has just really been the staple throughout generations. But having mentioned the Reina Valera Bible translation, the reason that Valera's name is tacked on there is because Valera also had a significant contribution, and he'll be the last figure that I have time to highlight this morning. Cipriano de Valera, born in Fregenal de la Sierra, north of Sevilla, was a student for six years at the University of Sevilla. And while there, he studied dialectics and philosophy, graduating with a bachelor's degree. In his early 20s, presumably after his studies, he became a member of the Order of Observantine Hieronymites. And there he served at the monastery of San Isidro alongside Reina and other Protestants. And uh, they were probably, as I mentioned, about 20 monks that were there. Unlike those who remained behind and were martyred in the most brutal fashion by the Inquisition, Valera managed to escape with Reina 
and he found his place of refuge first in Geneva. Now, while Reyna was quick to flee to England due to his friendship with Servetus and, well, what happened in Geneva, it's believed that Valera stayed longer. Over the course of time, Reyna would become less Calvinistic in his theology and more Lutheran, eventually writing a Lutheran catechism towards the latter years of his life for little children. But the same could not be said of Valera. Valera was very much an image of Calvin in his thinking and theology, which is due in large part to the fact that he single-handedly translated Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion into Spanish. Valera did not, however, stay in Geneva long term. He had great appreciation for John Calvin. He had great appreciation for his theology and for all of his contributions. But given how many heretics had come out from the land of Spain, and by this I mean heretics as regarded by both Catholics and Protestants alike, there was a particular disdain in Geneva against the Spanish in general. And therefore, feeling unwelcome, Valera followed Reyna's path to England. However, as opposed to settling in London as Reyna did, he went on to take a position at the University of Cambridge as professor of theology, eventually becoming a fellow of Magdalene College, and in the year 1565 received his master's degree from the University of Oxford, a testament to his intellectual vigor and his sharpness of doctrine. He would, in fact, become known to the chagrin of the Inquisition as the Spanish reformer par excellence. It was believed that there was no one his equal who spoke the Spanish tongue when it came to Reformed doctrine. Now, from between this time of his academic achievements to his later move to London, we have very little historical information. But we, we, what we do know is that Protestant England considered Valera to be a most valuable asset in its conflict with Catholic Spain. Several works were written by Valera while in England, such as the two treatises on the Pope and Mass. He also wrote a treatise to confirm the Christian faith of the Barbary captives, which we happen to have this year. And this was simply a treatise he had written to many Protestant converts who were uh, taken as slaves by the, is the, the Muslim Barbary pirates, which were essentially raiding coastal regions. But he also wrote in such a way that was also appealing to unbelievers such as Catholics and as well as Jews and Muslims. He provides the most beautiful apologetic in that book. They were all considered theological reformed artillery by the English because they were printed and they were disseminated into Spanish territories after the failed invasion of the Spanish Armada. If you're familiar with the history, the Spanish wanted to invade England. They did not succeed and England was essentially waging its own warfare by having several reformed works translated into Spanish and disseminated into Spain. Valera was one of the most significant assets they had on hand. Now, it's fair to say that we know more of Valera's achievements in his writings than of his personal life at this point, thus far at least, because there's more research to be done. But what we do know occurred after this period of his life was that after Reyna had fled the country due to the scandal orchestrated by the Inquisition, he moved to London to take on that pastoral mantle of the Spanish church that had been planted there. Now, what happened to that church is still a question that historians have yet to answer, but it may just be that Valera was its second and perhaps final pastor, and eventually it was absorbed by one of the consistories. But all of this just gives you a bit of an idea as to the life uh, of Valera and what he contributed in light of the Spanish expatriated Reformation. But perhaps the most significant contribution was his editorial work on Reyna's Spanish Bible translation. And this is, in fact, the last historical note we have uh, on record of his life. Uh, if you were to review as to when he passes away, we have the date 1602, and the only reason we have that is because we know he published this second edition of the Spanish Bible, and after that there's no more mention of his name in any historical record. But what we do know is that in 1602, this second edition of Reina's Bible translation was published as La Biblia del Cantaro. As a matter of fact, the Cantero Institute takes its name as inspired from that Spanish Bible translation. Now, Valera didn't touch much of Reyna's translation work, but he did reorganize its content to better reflect the structure of other translated Protestant Bibles. And this included the omission of the Apocrypha, 
and the grouping of Old and New Testament books into how they are reflected in our Bibles today. And this was considered Valera's final life achievement. It might even be considered his magnum opus. And he was most happy to do this in service to the Lord, and he was most happy to do this in love for every person who spoke the Spanish tongue, as can be discerned from many of his writings. Well, four historical figures, and we've only scratched the surface of the Spanish Reformation. And unfortunately, I don't have time to delve deeper this morning. But let me highlight, however, just a few resources for your own reading and consideration, and then I'll proceed to what we can learn for today. For those interested in learning more about the Spanish Reformation, there are several writings and archived works worth surveying. There is, for example, that monumental collection published in the mid-19th century by the Spaniard Luis de Usos y Rio, uh, with the limited help of the Englishman Benjamin Baron Whiffen. Uh, this collection was a 20-volume compilation of writings of the Spanish reformers, published solely in Spanish as Reformistas Antiguos Españoles. And it's a work that the Cantero Institute is committed to not only translate into English, but expand with other works that were excluded. And they were excluded likely because Rio's lack of access to other manuscripts at the time. Uh, he clearly didn't have everything available to him. And uh, one such publication of that expansion of the old Spanish reformers that's now in print today is Ponce's Exposition of the First Psalm of David, which I had mentioned to you, dated to about the year 1546. And uh, we have almost near to completion volume 31, which is Juan de Valdez's Dialogue of Doctrine. He's another Spanish reformer. Uh, his volume 24, which is uh, short treatises, as well as several of other writings by Valera himself. Uh, other titles worth considering are the Biblioteca Wifenania, which is a three volume set. Uh, it should actually be in public domain, so you should find it in Google Books. Uh, we also have Marcel Bataillon's two volume set, Erasme et l'Espagne, which is in French, unfortunately, and has not yet been translated into English. There is, however, Paul J. Halbin's Three Spanish Heretics. Uh, there's also the Spanish Confession of the Christian Faith by Reina, which I had mentioned, and a recently retyped set by the Cantero Institute of the History of the Spanish Reformation by Thomas McCree. And Thomas McCree is well known amongst the Reform community in terms of his writings and the historical uh, rec records he has kept. That is available as well at the book table. Now there are several other works to consult, but these are but a few. But our hope in the coming years is to be able to bring much more of this material into the common English tongue in order that the church today might benefit from what wisdom these Spanish reformers have to offer us. Of course, this isn't the exclusive work of the Institute. We also train in worldview and other uh, matters relating to reform theology, uh, but this just happens to be one area in which we are able to specialize in. Now, last but not least, I wish to make just a few short remarks on what we can draw from the Spanish Reformation, particularly what I've addressed this morning for our living por amdeo, before the face of God. The first of these remarks is concerning the power of the Word of God and its necessity for its clear presentation. When we look back at the efforts of the humble Julianillo, for example, in smuggling Spanish scriptures and Reformed literature into a hostile culture, and as we discovered the transformation this began to bring about in the hearts of those who read them, we're reminded of the transformative power of the Word of God and of the necessity of having that inspired word accessible in our own tongue. Now, we have no shortage of Bibles in English and Spanish, but we, can't, we can probably think of various people groups around the world who still don't have a full Bible translation in their mother tongue. If you were, for example, to travel to Washington, D.C., and you pay a visit to the Museum of the Bible, uh, there's an exhibit there with a vast library of books. And each book has the word Bible written on it, but in different languages. And those books represent Bibles that have yet to be translated into whatever language is on that book cover. And there are several. It might be difficult to imagine, given our rich Protestant heritage today, as uh, Europeans and North Americans. But just two years ago, to cite just an example, the Old Testament was fully translated for the very first time in the Eastern Apurimac Quechua language of Peru. There's a need to support more Bible translations so that all may hear and know the truth of God and the gospel revealed therein. Mm -hmm. 
Furthermore, as it relates to Julianillo's devotion to the Lord and his passionate dedication to his mission, because in this sense he really was a missionary, we ought to feel exhorted, called, to seek to make the Scriptures clear and comprehensible to all. Not all of us can participate significantly in translating the word into another language, but all of us can certainly seek to translate its message into a language that the common person today can understand. There's a significant gulf of understanding between today's generation and when the Scriptures were written. If you were to just find any person on the street and you hand them a Bible and you ask them to read from Chronicles or you ask them to read from Psalms or Proverbs or perhaps from the New Testament, you ask them what does it mean, they will not really know. Who else but the Church of Christ can interpret and explain these scriptures to the people? Like Philip with the eunuch in Acts 8, 26-40. We are called to explain the scriptures, to sow the seed of the gospel, trusting that the Lord will do His work of salvation and renewal. Is that something we can set our hearts to do? Whatever may be our eschatological position, one thing we can all agree on is our mission as God's church for the here and now. Another short remark, perhaps my second remark, draws from what God did through the figures like Julianillo and Ponce. Both these men withstood terrible punishments. Both these men were publicly condemned and slandered and humiliated before the eyes of all men, and yet their spirits never broke. Was there some strength in their spirits which they could call their own? No. No, not at all. The strength of spirit we see in both Julianillo and Ponce was of the Holy Spirit, for how else can we account for their unshakable conviction and perseverance in the face of such suffering and death? They were martyrs, whether they burned at the stake or died in the dungeon of the, of the Castillo de Triana. They were martyrs. And such sacrifice is worthy of our attention because they remind us of the courage that we must have to be bold witnesses in a hostile culture. And that such courage can only be mustered when we are entirely dependent on the Spirit of God. Our times may be quite different. The enemies of God may look quite different. But our missional context remains much the same in the sense that we are God's people in a fallen, hostile world, and we are called to proclaim the truth, anticipating both positive reactions of the gospel as well as negative hostility and persecution. And in such times where we must wrestle with our culture's increasing apostasy with the ongoing moral and sexual revolutions and the rise and dissemination of false philosophies of life, we must be willing and able to proclaim the true philosophy of life, the Christian worldview that we all embrace and confess, the inspired, inscripturated revelation of God and the Christ it reveals and exalts. Lastly, drawing from figures such as Reina and Valera, who translated and refined the Spanish Bible, we can discern in them the spirit of Semper Reformanda, the church always reforming according to Scripture. We might ask, is that spirit prevalent amongst God's church today? Are we continually seeking to be reformed to the clear teaching of Scripture? And I don't just mean in terms of our ecclesiology, because many tend to think that this applies to the institutional church and nothing more. No, I mean everything we do in every sphere of life, in utter defiance of this false, sacred, secular divide which has been upheld by our culture. It was the American Christian philosopher H. Evan Runner who said that life is religion, and in the sense that everything we do is an act of worship and driven by a religious heart commitment, he is absolutely right. All of life must be lived for all of Christ, for otherwise our lives are either oriented in an apostate direction or compromised by some synthesis of truth and error. As God's people living Coram Deo, before the very face of God, we must seek to do all things in such a way that honors and glorifies our God. And to do so, we must embrace that reformational spirit to reform our hearts and minds to the will of God revealed and expressed in His inspired Word. Christ is Lord, and our lives ought to reflect that He is Lord overall.
With that, I close. And may we prepare our hearts and minds for Dr. Ted Van Rolte's next talk on the Reformation in Europe. God bless you all. Thank mm -hmm. you.